The Biden administration's new national security strategy has a major focus on Russia and the People's Republic of China, both of which are in their own particular ways authoritarian regimes with considerable, perhaps global ambitions. A few weeks after that document came out, China's ruling Communist Party held its Congress. And the current leader, Xi Jinping, was given a third term in power. What does his continued leadership mean and how should we understand this regime run by a communist party, but it is also avidly building out its economy? To learn more about the Chinese regime, its domestic character and its global ambitions, I'm delighted to have with us today Scott McDonald, who is a scholar of Chinese political thought. Welcome, Scott. Hello, Alan. It's great to have you. I, I thought it would be great to start with what has been in the news a lot lately, and maybe that's a way into the topic of what is this regime about. And so maybe tell us a bit about what is the party congress, how often does it meet, and how, what were you looking for in, in trying to understand the developments coming out of that? Okay, the um, 20th party congress is the congress of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, they used to be kind of ad hoc. It's become standardized over the last several decades of every five years. They have a, a party Congress where all the senior leadership uh, of the party gets together, and talks about the way ahead. Um, there's part of it that's largely for show. Uh, part of it happens behind closed doors, but a lot of the real work happens in the weeks leading up to it, um, which is deciding what the you know policy is going to put forward as their plans for the next five years and deciding the leadership structure for the next five years, which is probably what people, uh, including myself, were looking at more than anything going into the party Congress. Um, and that's the case every five years, but this time, especially since all indications were that Xi Jinping would um, buck what had become a norm, uh, it's not in policy anywhere, but a norm of doing two terms as general secretary and then stepping down. And uh, this was telegraphed that he wouldn't do this five years ago when there was no clear successor uh, on the Politburo Standing Committee and uh, you know, lots of uh, domestic propaganda and news items suggesting that he was the leader to stay. And sure enough, uh, it, it actually technically it's not at the Congress, it's the day after the Congress, they introduced the new Politburo Standing Committee and it was uh, a clean sweep. Right. Um, the past several Politburo Standing Committees have been a bit of a mix of factions. Um, who actually is in power? What concessions have to be made to other party factions uh, in order for the top guy to have his say? And this time it was a clean sweep. Right. Everybody on the on the Standing Committee is a Xi acolyte. Uh, came up largely through supporting Xi Jinping. So the results were, yep, Xi Jinping uh, is in absolute control, which is what a lot of people forecast, but weren't quite sure if he'd get everybody he wanted. But this demonstrates that he is pretty much in sole control. So uh, w reading about this and seeing pictures from the Congress, one thing that struck me is everywhere you look, there's the hammer and sickle emblem, what we associate with communism and, and I think the Chinese Communist Party, that's its name. and we. we Think of China as a communist regime, but how communist is it? How do you understand it? How, how would you classify the way things work there? Um, the Chinese Communist Party is absolutely a Leninist party built in the Leninist model. However, the ideology of communism uh, stopped being relevant long ago. Um, some would question what, whether it was ever uh, that relevant to, to the, the governing of the PRC, but certainly it's not relevant today. Uh, that being said, you know, it is its history, its ancestry. We have to pay homage to that. Uh, the legitimacy of the party and its role in leadership was originally based on that. So they continue to, you know, mention it, to pay homage to Marxist-Leninist thought, uh, Marxist-Leninist Mao Zedong thought, right? And uh, to, to show that, hey, we're still part of this tradition, it's legitimizing, but communism as a system of social organization long since dead so scott we have a party and there's a committee and then there's she so how well do we understand the, the way decisions are made in this authoritarian regime what, what's what's the evidence for thinking one is more dominant than the other how do you understand that so one caveat is it is hard 
to peer behind the circle. We, we don't have a whole lot of firsthand information of what's going on in the meetings of the Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, however, what we understand is that is the, the primary decision-making body that decides what the party's going to do and where they're going to go. Um, there have been times where it has been very much an individual leader, uh, Mao-led, uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, even though he did not hold a, an official position during the last years of his life, he still basically ran what happened. Post Deng, uh, it was much more of a collaborative process, right? The, the general secretary was the first among equals, but there was a real sense that he had to balance factions, build coalitions, and uh, you know, make sure that things kind of went to forward as a group. They decided what they would do and they, and they did it. Um, Xi Jinping, over the course of the last several years, um, first of all, starting very early on, he was putting himself in charge of leading small groups that would uh, look into certain policy options and report back to the Politburo Standing Committee. And he was taking on the leadership of more and more of these. And now he has eliminated all other factions from the Politburo Standing Committee. So more and more, it appears that it is not a committee of equals that uh, decides what's gonna happen, Xi Jinping is personally putting his stamp on policy of the Communist Party. So I'm fascinated by your point that it, the communist ideology ceased to be a significant factor and maybe it wasn't a factor for a long time. So if it's not communist, that's not what's driving, what are the ideas behind this regime? How do you understand it? What's the, what's the there animating uh, the whole thing? I think the primary concern of the party is the continued power of the party. Right? It is a Leninist party. We exist to be in power. We're the ones who know best. We should be in power. And now all these people have their livelihoods wrapped up in the party. Uh, you know, the, the, the party leadership, uh, their whole position depends on the fact that the party rules. Um, the stated national interest of the People's Republic of China, the state, not the party, is maintenance of the political system led by the party. Right? because the party runs everything. Right. Everything else is ancillary to that. Right, the, the PRC technically has two other goals, territorial integrity and sovereignty and uh, economic development. Why? Both those support party rule. So as I've said before, the, the principle that really governs the party is the party's power. And all actions taken support that in one way or another either specifically directly to support power in some way or to support its conception of what it thinks it or the People's Republic of China should be with it as it at the helm. So is this a way to understand how a, a nominally or at least self-described communist party has overseen massive economic development in China that's just historic in terms of its, its scales? So is the, your understanding then that this is this was done because it would reinforce the party's ongoing rule. Is that how you see it? Um, in short, yes. I think that as the party has tried various economic uh, tools uh, over the decades, the primary goal has been its maintenance uh, of its position of power. Um, uh, Mao Zedong pursued uh, collectivization, uh, partly because it was a good communist thing to do, but partly because he saw the continued revolution as the source of his power and the source of the party's future. Um, Deng Xiaoping pursued uh, economic reform, uh, both after the Great Leap Forward and after the Cultural Revolution, uh, because he saw that the country tearing itself apart was threatening its position of power. They needed to, to fiddle with the way economics was done, because if they didn't, they would lose power. Um, and Proceeding past Tiananmen, the party was absolutely focused on economic development as part of the, um, the you know, uh, implicit deal it made with the people. Hey, you follow our lead politically and, you know, you'll be able to get rich because getting rich is glorious. And so we'll move the economy in that direction. Moreover, you know, this in increases our position at home, our power, our ability to influence our environment, and uh, which now in the post-Cold War world, we think, it, think it's time for us to influence our environment a little more. So this helps us do it. And so now Xi Jinping over the past uh, decade has taken many actions which outsiders are scratching their heads over. Ah, this is not good for the economy. Why would Xi Jinping do this? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, 
the extent to which some of these actions are or not good for the economy, even they would uh, argue about. But the, the point is the economy is secondary. So if Xi Jinping feels threatened by the uh, potential power base of Jack Ma, even though Jack Ma's company being free to operate in the economic sphere is doing great things for the PRC qua economy, if it's a threat to Xi Jinping's power, it's a threat. And we need to handle that by clamping it down, by teaching Jack Ma a lesson about who's in charge and, and getting the ducks in a row. Because the party's position in power, its ability to stamp out potential uh, alternative sources of authority is much more important than economic development. And in fact, they've stated this explicitly in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. People like to raise the, the point that a, um, uh, a war over the Taiwan would cause severe economic damage to the People's Republic of China. And they've said explicitly, yeah, noted, but that's not what's important, right? We think this is important for our continued place in power, and we will do it if we have to, economy be damned. So I just want to double back on some of what you were telling us to put a bit of a historical, some, some milestones to help people see where we are in terms of the development. So you mentioned the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, 1960, is that about right? Or is that a little bit earlier, a little bit later? Where are we? Uh, uh, Great Leap Forward was late 1950s, Cultural okay. Revolution was uh, mid 60s to mid 70s. And then Deng Xiaoping comes along in uh, 1980 something. Am I getting that so, right? So, well, more than once. Uh, <laughs> after the uh, leap forward, he was one of the ones brought in uh, to start fixing things. Uh, okay. However, he really achieved power as the paramount leader uh, after Mao's death. And in 19... Uh, he died, Mao died in 76, bit of an ignorantum with Hua Guofeng, bit of, you know, tip dancing over who's in charge. By 1978, it's Deng Xiaoping, uh, okay. who's basically taken the reins, put his people in key positions, and is the undisputed, or as we say, paramount leader. And so Deng Xiaoping is the one who oversees the move to opening up the economy to some degree. And then that's what we start seeing through the 80s and 90s. And then and, and Xi Jinping comes in about 10 years ago, right? He That's when he takes over as the paramount leader. Is that the, right, the framing? 2012, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that he's had two five-year terms and now this is his, his, he's now entering the, the third unprecedented third term, I guess, is that uh, what the party's just ratified. Yes. Uh, and then you uh, mentioned- Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah unprecedented is, uh, okay. it, it's, uh, it's, we say it's norm breaking, right? Because the okay. last two general secretaries, and this was put in place by Deng Xiaoping actually, because he thought that the uh, leadership struggles and was a little bit too, uh, destabilizing. We don't need the Mao uh, cult of personality anymore. This is how we're going to do it. Uh, not actually officially written down. It's just a norm, and and he's busted that. The, okay, and then just one the, other the piece legal. Of yeah, where there's a uh, an idea of terms is technically the president of the People's Republic of China had a term limit. Um, okay. Xi Jinping holds three posts: general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party chairman of the uh, Central Military Commission, and president of the People's Republic of China. The president is the least important of those three. That's the one that had the term limits. Okay, so that's really helpful. And then just one other piece of context that I, so you mentioned Jack Ma. So he is the, the, the person behind Alibaba, which is a massive uh, online, it's sort of like, a, I mean, maybe this is a fair comparison. It's, it's China's Amazon.com and in, in, in it's sort of, growth scale and it doesn't have the same range of things, but it, it's a massive business that has brought a lot of wealth to uh, uh, Jack Ma. Is that a fair summary of who well, he is? Uh, it's uh, their Amazon uh, and their eBay uh, all okay. rolled into one. And he was about to go public, uh, put an in, uh, initial public offering on Ant Financial. So he's moving large in the financial sector as well. So a large conglomerate. And what's happened to Jack Ma? Jack Ma disappeared for a while and uh, he came back and he has stopped uh, mouthing off. He stopped uh, speaking about how we should fix the economy, what we could do to the economy, um, about whether or not the party's making the right decisions. He's been very quiet. And the initial public offering did not go forward. Uh, I believe he was told that it would not go forward, uh, whether that's 
punishment or the uh, party trying to control the financial system and who has the financial, who runs the financial system. But no, Jack Ma, you don't hear a whole lot from him lately, though he's technically uh, free and back running his business. Um, I, I want to dig into one issue that I think I've heard you talk about this, but I want to just put it to you as a question. So there, when she came around, there were people who wanted to say, who, who said and, and wanted to believe that uh, here is the Chinese Gorbachev. And for people who maybe not remember or know who Gorbachev was, he came along and he uh, he was in power in the Soviet Union and he had policies that opened up the society in, in, in modest ways. And yet that sort of is recognized as that was the beginning of the end for communism. So the, the, the policies that Gorbachev came in and so he sort of presided over the, the, the tapering off of the, the Soviet regime. And so people said, well, it, maybe she is the person to do that. And it, from everything you've said so far, I, I find that hard to believe. How, how do you think of that? And what was, what do you think of his view of his role? So um, first of all, I think that uh, that whole narrative uh, that was prominent in the Western press, especially here in the United States, was largely wishful thinking born of um, some mirror imaging and believing that our policies would work. You know, for decades prior to that, uh, the position of the United States government and many in industry and, and in academia was, you know, the uh, course of history is going towards uh, liberal, liberal representative systems. Um, economic engagement helps lead to that. We've been engaging with the PRC. Look at all they're doing to make their economy more vigorous and uh, and free, free is a, a, an interesting word there, um, but to, so obviously this is the path of history. And now here comes Xi Jinping, by the way, he was the party secretary in some of the Southern provinces, which is where great economic stuff is happening. And he's probably the guy, you know, this is the course that things have been going on and he's probably the guy. And I remember, watching some of the news back in, uh, in 2011, 12, and I'm like, where's this coming from? Where are the statements of policy? There, there are not any, right? They purposely, he, he's very quiet. Why do we actually think this is gonna happen? And it seemed to me a lot of it was projecting hopes and, and dreams of the West onto him. In terms of how he sees himself, you know, he thought that the party was getting astray, that it needed to be uh, reinvigorated and put back in power. Um, you know, the, the Hu Jintao uh, period, the 10 years before him, was seen by many within the party, and I think by Xi as kind of just muddling through, and the, it's the do-nothing era, and things are getting too loose, and the party's not in control as it should be. And I think he saw an important role of, um, re-establishing a, a firm leadership central direction of the communist party and uh as a party qua party and then of xi jinping as him as the head of the party and some of the um initial things he did supported both of those um the anti-corruption campaign served both to reduce uh one of the the complaints that people had against the party, right? There are corrupt officials. Yes, let's target the corrupt officials. And um, he largely targeted those who were from different factions and disagreed with him conveniently enough. So it did, it both strengthened the party because one complaint is, hey, there's corruption and we need to stamp that out. And um, it got rid of people who could oppose him. So I think he was much more focused on party building. He was not focused on, uh, uh, liberalizing the economy and certainly not liberalizing the political system. I've been reading that the way to think of the last 10 years or so is that China has become more authoritarian in important ways. We, we've heard about its surveillance of the population. There's a social credit system where you're tracked and your behavior is rated in vast databases and tracking apps on people's phone and someone I know went to uh, China and their colleague was there and they, they jaywalked uh, and they got an instant fine on their phone through one of these apps that tracks you and that has access to you. So th there's ways in which it's, it's more, and, and censorship is being sort of imposed even more stringently. Uh, 
do you see that? I mean, do you think that is a pattern or is it, is it just, it varies over time or do you think there's a direction to be read here? Um, I think that the party has definitely gotten uh, better at um, actively influencing. Uh, there's long been an ability to shape, um, you know, one thing um, that we in the West when we point fingers and say propaganda or censorship, we often focus on um, you know, misinformation or keeping outside information out. Um, and uh, the party does that, but the party is also very good at trumpeting positive and accurate information that it thinks is important and that the people should know, right? So that the, the information stream that people get is not necessarily untruthful but it's very focused on what the party thinks is important that people think, right? And so there's this positive information flow um, that I think is a huge part of it. Um, the social credit system is certainly very scary from a, you know, a Western perspective that they're being tracked and you say stuff and now your, your, your job could be at risk. You, you jaywalk and now you're not gonna get the apartment you wanted. Um, what is, uh, one thing that I find frightening about that actually is the, sense to which it has just kind of been accepted in society and exists there. Um, I haven't been to, to the PRC for several years, um, but, uh, you know, the social credit system, you know, uh, you ask a young lady on a date and she's going to pull out her phone and say, well, let me check you out and pull up the social credit score and decide if you're a worthy date. Right, so it's it's being inculcated into the populace. Oh yeah, this is a useful tool. I can see if this guy's worth dating. Right? Oh, I shouldn't go out with him. I'm not going to get a good apartment. Um, and so that has been very effective. And it doesn't even have to be uh, in your face control. It becomes passive control. And so the result of things like this is, I think, the regime has become uh, much more authoritarian. Uh, and it's a, and totalitarian and the ability to control information and manipulate the way that, that people think and behave. I wanted to draw attention to one issue that has been in the news a lot, and we, we don't have to get into the, uh, the sort of science behind it, because this is a different conversation, but the, the policy of COVID zero, zero COVID in China, it's mind boggling. I mean, we've, I think it was earlier this year, we saw pictures of people being boarded up in their neighborhoods, prevented from leaving their apartments, I read recently, and now we're in October as we're recording this, there are cities with 13 million people, 10 cases of COVID are found, everyone is locked in. Like this is, it's very stringent, people forced into uh, um, quarantine uh, locations and so forth. What the, so leaving aside that that is a policy, I don't think there's any justification for that. Uh, but what interests me in that is just the, both the totalitarian aspect of it and the way that China is now still treating this as a, as a crisis, that this is what they think is the solution. But the, the perspective of the, the regime towards individuals, like the, the, that kind of, because I think there's a philosophic issue here, is like, how do you think of this? Are they citizens? Are they subjects? Are they, are they what? How do you, what is the relationship between the people of China and the, and the way the state views them? How, how do you, what do you make of that in terms of where we are now in China's history? So it's an interesting question. I really like the way that you phrased it. Um, I tend to use the word subjects purposefully uh, instead of citizen uh, to indicate the extent to which their lives are subject to the whim of those in power, right? Which, which really is the, the key thing going on here. The, the whim of the party will affect your life dramatically. You know, the, the average um, little meat on a stick seller has a lot less regulation on his life and his ability to do business than uh, a similar guy in the United States, in fact. However, there is no rule of law. It's subject to the whim of the moment and what the lo local party official desires. And bam, he's now out of a job, out of a livelihood. So they're absolutely subject to the whim of the party in that regard. Um, the, the party likes to trumpet, and if you look at the, the report that she read from uh, at the party congress, uh, the party likes to, to trumpet uh, how it is there for the people and protects the people, right? But within the, um, the Chinese worldview, and, and I personally think the, um, the classical morality as 
passed down from the the classics of, of Taoism and Confucianism still play a huge role in society, uh, even in the in the CCP, to, in, the, in the Communist Party, and in the PRC, uh, the country today. And the role of each individual is to fill their appropriate place in society. And the leaders are supposed to lead. They are supposed to rule. The, the guy selling meat on a stick is supposed to sell meat on a stick and do what he's supposed to do and pay a, appropriate respect to the leader. And if the leader says it's no longer good to sell your meat on a stick or you must be locked in your apartment for the sake of society, then that's what you should do. And to the leadership, ultimately concerned with maintaining their position at the top of the hierarchy, but how do you do that? You do that by ensuring the overall health of society. And if that means a few people or 13 million people have to be locked in their rooms for, for two months, then that's what you do. And that is uh, not just acceptable, it's moral in their code to do so. And so um, I think that you know, morally, they don't have any problem doing that. And certainly, you know, nothing standing in the way legally, but the party in some sense thinks it's filling their role. Now, as you pointed out, even if all that were true, it may not actually be a smart thing to do. Um, but I think the party got itself stuck um, in uh, coming out early and strongly for the only way to solve this is COVID zero. Oh, by the way, the fact that we're doing COVID zero and those crazy Westerners are not proves our superiority and our fitness to rule. And they kept trumpeting this over and over. And I think she probably feels he's backed himself into a corner a little bit and he cannot let go of, he fears, he cannot let go of COVID zero without undermining his legitimacy. And you know, we talked earlier about what to watch for at the party Congress. Certainly one of the things some people were looking for was, was he going to leave himself an out in his statements at the, the party Congress to back off of COVID zero, right? Because we've managed to control it because, you know, was he going to give himself an out? And he didn't, he doubled down again in his speech that this is the way to do it. So now he's tied up his legitimacy and the party's uh, leadership role in this COVID zero policy. And so they're, they're a little bit stuck in it. Now, if you read a lot of stuff in the Western press right now, especially um, uh, Li Qiang, one of uh, possibly the number two, he was the second guy to walk on stage after Xi at the end of the, the conference, uh, now in the Politburo Standing Committee, he used to be party secretary of Shanghai and uh, for the lockdown. And so there's a lot of the Western press is saying, even though he's tainted, right? Even though he had this hiccup in Shanghai. And I think it's important that we question that view of him because from our perspective, the Shanghai lockdown absolutely taints him. What a horrible idea. We saw videos of unhappy people but from the perspective of the party, um, he did what was right. He did what was necessary. He stood up in the face of even some, some international criticism and followed Xi's policy and did what was necessary for the party to maintain its role. And we in the West also judged that the people were very upset because we saw, um, uh, you know, some some examples of protesting, some people upset and shouting, but I don't get the sense that there is mass um, anger at the COVID zero policy uh, across the, uh, the country. I'm not sure that, that people don't see that the party has this role. And I think it's important to look at it from their context and understand how they see it. And that Xi Jinping also sees that and thinks, hey, this is what I need to do. So while I think the COVID zero doesn't make any sense, you know, uh, my job is to try to understand why it makes sense to Xi Jinping. And I think it's the, that combination of, I, I said this was going to be it. It's my legitimacy. I backed myself into a corner. And you know what? I'm doing the right thing.
by my role in the hierarchy and my role in the society. So the the fact that people might die of being locked in their homes or the, just the emotional, psychological toll, that is all just an acceptable cost for the sake of the greater society or the, the party's longevity in power. I wanted to bring in a number of others so we might be hopping around a bit from other things we talked about. I want to try to connect this to the main thread that you were telling us about how the party thinks of itself and the ideas that are, are moving it. And so just to help us understand a bit, so I find that there are two other things I want to ask you about. One is Hong Kong, and the other is um, the the internment of Uyghurs. That's a Muslim minority group in China, and both of these, from the perspective of what is the party trying to do here? What, what is the what are the ideas behind this? Why would they bother with this? What 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 is the? How do they even see this as something that's worth their time? Why not just leave these people alone? What's the point here? So on Hong Kong, just for, for context, so during the, uh, the peak of COVID, uh, China took this opportunity to really crush the people of Hong Kong. It exerted more power. And I think that it, Hong Kong is even more tightly controlled than it was before. A lot of people ended up intimidated out of their, their um, careers or in jailed and a number of uh, newspapers decided to close because they, they felt they couldn't be, honestly report the news in Hong Kong. So, that, so that's Hong Kong. And then just uh, as a snapshot about what's happening with Uyghurs, th there are credible claims that there are thousands and thousands of them are being interned in so-called education camps. And the, from what we can, what I've read, it's the idea is that the, it's because they have a certain religious uh, uh, approach to life, this minority Muslims uh, perspective on life, that that's, part of what the problem is, and that's what they're being drummed out of them. It's like, this is not compatible with the way the regime views them. So maybe take one of those at a time and just help us understand why, why is this a, a priority for the regime? What do they see as the goal? And how does this connect with what you see as the ideas animating it? Sure. And, and let's connect it first, and then we'll handle them in, in pieces, right? Because an objectivism teaches that we must think of things in principle, right? In order to understand the world and be able to apply knowledge, principles are important. And the principle, as I alluded to earlier, that guides the party is power and its own power. So Hong Kong, how does that apply here? And I think there's two important ways, uh, you know, and this gets to why not just leave them alone. And you have to go back in history and the, the severing of Hong Kong uh, from Imperial China uh, by the British and the century of humiliation where the uh, party has long claimed that there was, you know, a hundred years of uh, being humiliated by the West that these pieces were taken away. And the party uh, tied its legitimacy in part to getting these places back. And we mentioned earlier how communism is no longer uh, a valid um, ideological strain. When communism was dead, uh, the party leaned heavily on nationalism and economic development. Part of that nationalism was we have to bring back these things that were uh, taken away from us, and Hong Kong was one of them. So it became very important to get Hong Kong back and not allow it to remain separate. Um, the British were interested in holding on to it. Uh, PRC said, no, it's coming back. Um, and so even though it was this odd system had been heavily informed by a hundred years of British common law. The people had much more freedom, both economic and political. And, um, but we still want it back. We're going to try to kind of keep it separate, the special autonomous, uh, region, um, special administrative region, I'm sorry, uh, in order to wall it off, but also make it look like we're respecting, uh, your way of doing things. So that's how we ended up with the odd situation because the party needed it to legitimize its power. We brought China back together. However, um, the growing sense that they wanted to rule themselves, the idea that, hey, we thought we were going to get universal suffrage and uh, direct elections for our executive, that the sense continued to grow in Hong Kong and the party realized that it was threatening their position, right? It's an alternative source of authority. It's no longer just the party's handpicked representatives in Hong Kong. It's all these rabble who want to rule themselves. And we can't allow that to happen. So they, they looked for opportunities to, to crack down on it. And they tried to get the um, 
the Hong Kong legislature to do it, um, you know, with the anti-extradition uh, bill and that the people opposed it uh, uh, dramatically, where, you know, at one point, basically one in seven people in Hong Kong was out on the street protesting and the, the party could not allow this to remain. So they, they cracked down hard and, and let's face it, COVID was very valuable for them in that regard. It made it easier because they cracked down and then, oh, by the way, it's unsafe for you all to be out. So it helped them uh, keep them inside. But the, the key here is it threatens their authority if the uh, average Hong Konger gets a say in how Hong Kong is run. Because the only people who get a say in how the People's Republic of China is run is the party. And we can't have those people doing it. And we certainly can't have it spreading to the rest of the PRC. Um, Xinjiang, different situation, same principle, right? It's power. So Xinjiang, which is technically the uh, 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 autonomous region, special autonomous region of, um, uh, of Xinjiang, it's the uh, out in the northwest around the Talamakan Desert, um, the ancient Silk Road, uh, a Turkic uh, Central Asian peoples have long populated it. Uh, but it was incorporated uh, on and off into imperial China. Um, and then uh, the Qing dynasty had it. And so that's part of the area that the, the party wanted to ensure it established control over. Um, there's uh, some strategic reasons from resources to it's where their space launches take place to trade routes into Central Asia. And so they want to make sure they maintain control of it. Their concern is that the, the Uyghurs, you identified, a, a central Turkic uh, Muslim people, um, had their own identity and wanted to be treated as such. And so um, the PRC over the years has attempted to encourage Han migration, Han Chinese, the predominant uh, ethnic group of Chinese is called Han, um, and to change the um, ethnic makeup of the Xinjiang region by increasing the number of uh, Han. Um, another factor that influences is the, um, the growth in uh, Muslim-based uh, terrorist movements in the Middle East and into Central Asia. Um, it, one, gave the PRC a pretext. Uh, two, there were actual cases of Uyghurs being discovered training at these camps. So like, see, look, uh, bad things are going on here. And um, it, gave, it, it both gave them a reason to go in and control it tighter, but it also increased their fear that there was a growing um, identity here linked to forces outside the PRC that could help to cleave it off of the People's Republic of China. And this is unacceptable from the party's perspective. We keep the, the uh, PRC together. So they have um, instituted many uh, ways to try to keep it together from Han migration, sinicization, and now these re-education camps where they are interning um, thousands, uh, uh, I don't know, we're, we're over a million now, I think, of uh, Uyghur peoples in these re-education camps to make them love the motherland, the motherland being China, um, at the same time that they're actively trying to uh, reduce the Uyghurs as a percentage of the population there so that they control it, because it is about the party being in control. And if we have to wipe out Uyghur identity and culture and even some of the people to do it, then that's what we'll do. Because what's the standard? The party's position at the top of the hierarchy. So I want to start wrapping up, pulling some of these threads together. I, I had a lot of questions I wanted to ask you about China's ambitions on the global stage, particularly economic realm. Maybe we can touch on that, but I, I want, I want to make a plug for a conversation we had with our friend Adam Mossoff, a professor of law, about China's liberalization and the, the threat to IP. And so, so we'll link to that if it's available, or we'll make it available for people. That, that occurred, uh, that panel occurred at our uh, annual conference this past summer. So just to recommend people go and explore that. So I, I just wanted to touch on one aspect of that, which is we think of China as having opened up its economy in a big way and a lot of uh, foreign companies have gone there. But there's an aspect of what China has been doing, which is to go to other countries and invest 
in them, help them build infrastructure and build factories and so forth. What is going on there? And how do you understand that from just, how does that connect with the broader picture of what China's trying to do on the world stage? Investing in factories in other countries? Yeah, and building out infrastructure, and, I, and particularly in places yeah. like Africa, yeah. I've read about. Yeah, those are two different things, right? Um, okay. So the the, uh, the infrastructure um, is uh, complicated, uh, but there's a couple things going on, right? Uh, part of it is um, uh, buying off states to be friendly with the PRC. Um, small African countries, you need a new road. I provide a new road, and now you'll vote the way I want you to vote in the United Nations General Assembly. Um, or, or now you sell me the minerals or oil that you have uh, rather than somebody else. Um, ancillary benefits to this, I make them a loan in uh, renminbi, the PRC currency. I force you to repay it in dollars. Uh, I sell you the services of local uh, PRC-based companies to go do the work and, and they're earning the money. I export mails that can't get brides. There's all kinds of benefits here. Um, with, with ports, some of this infrastructure is ports. Now I can use those for my warships, for my container ships. Uh, you know, this whole idea of building the, the string of pearls across the Indian Ocean, where the PRC has favored basing rights and, uh, and favored economic rights. So th there's many things that go into that whole infrastructure piece. It's, um, uh, there's economic value, there's political value, there's communication value in terms of who is the one who's taking care of the third world. There's normative value, who is the power that is setting the terms of trade for the future, right? That's what the One Belt, One Road system does by, by slapping that branding on it. It helps them to advertise that the uh, liberal world order, which is cracking by the way, uh, that the, the United States created is being replaced by the One Belt, One Road by the Sinosphere, and all roads lead to Beijing. So there's a normative element there as well. Um, and so uh, the infrastructure, I think, comes that way. Uh, and I think that's what you're really getting at. But since you mentioned it, I think the factories are interesting because the PRC's economic model is, is running out, right? For the past several decades, the PRC has grown because foreign companies using foreign capital and foreign intellectual property have come in and set up factories in the People's Republic of China to take advantage of the cheap labor market and then exported those goods to foreign customers. So except for cheap labor, the PRC is not important in that value chain. Well, this has done remarkable things for the PRC. It's done remarkable things for hundreds of millions of peasants who were brought out of poverty, right? It's great for them. However, um, wages are rising because things are going well and the PRC is being priced out of this market. And so foreign companies are starting to shift production overseas. And this is going to undermine the PRC's economic model since uh, though she is trying very hard to push this into action, they have not moved up the value chain. So as other companies started doing this, you started seeing some PRC companies now moving factories overseas to take advantage of cheap labor elsewhere so they could continue to be part of that profit chain. Uh, but in the long run, that's not going to solve the, the larger economic problems that the PRC is facing in the years ahead. Though I just glanced at the clock and we probably have nowhere near enough time to talk about the, uh, the economic problems facing the PRC. So see, I, I talked too long. We'll have to come back and do another conversation. I just want to ask you one more question about this. That, and maybe this is a bigger topic than I realized. So, when we hear about major Chinese tech companies like Huawei, um, I forget the other big one that was in the news not so long ago. And this is partly we hear about it because they're building out 5G networks, partly because they're just enormous, enormous companies. How do we understand the status of these companies? So if I if I, we talk about Apple, it's we know what it is. It's it, you can buy shares in Apple, and we know who the shareholders are. It's a publicly traded company. It, it's private. It, it, I mean, the government can control it. There's regulations and different things they could tell what to do with their iPhone jacks and what, what kind of cables they have to use. But but we know who owns Apple. Um, and if we talk about the, the Treasury Department, we know the Treasury Department is a branch of part of the government. We can trace out where all the different uh, elements of it. But then when we talk about a company coming out of China that is has grown to massive scale and 
it has people on the board who are party members or friendly with party members, the, the people running the company. How do we understand that? So how private are some of these so-called private companies? How much do they have to curry favor with the party? And, and, and maybe this is just take one example that you think is helpful, because I, I imagine there's variation here, but how, how uh, uh, what is the status of those kinds of organizations? Well, <clears throat> you are right to to make the caveat that everyone's probably a little different, right? Because of how it developed and who's in there. Um, but uh, I think the, the key is that the party does have many tentacles into these, right? Um, so Huawei, the, the guy who started it and some of the technology, he used to be in the People's Liberation Army. Um, these companies all have party committees that can, uh, at times, in some companies have been completely passive and not involved. But as soon as it matters to the party, they can get involved. In others, the party is so important that, you know, the, the deputy is sitting there in his office and he has the, the red phone, the, the party phone network on his desk. And when it rings, he does what he's told. Um, the, uh, the state, the PRC passed a law a few years back, the national security law that makes it explicit that companies are required to support the national security objectives of of the state so um the, if the party that the state and remember the party in the state we haven't talked too much about here basically the same the party guides the state but if uh they get a call and say you have to do this for the good of of china then you have to do it and so you cannot uh have confidence that at any given time, that the business decisions of these companies are being run purely from a private perspective. Um, because even if they are at this moment, at the next second, um, the party sweeps in and says, no, uh, we want you to do this. And if you, if you think about Huawei actively trying, and not just the company, but the state is pushing this, right? That they are actively building out uh, 5G infrastructure um, around the world. And that's the, the real issue there is people are afraid that there are back doors being built into this technology so that the PRC can monitor it all. Um, and the fact that we keep finding back doors in uh, hardware produced in the PRC that we've been guaranteed there are no back doors in uh, kind of lends credence to this fear. Um, and the other part of it is the, um, the PRC uh, looked at the development of the United States and they said, because the United States was in on the ground floor of telephony, of aviation, um, that they had a role in standard setting that um, gives them a position of advantage. And therefore, we want to be in on the ground floor of standard setting on the next big thing to give us a position of advantage, either in terms of just controlling it, uh, in terms of favoring our companies because we set the standards, um, in terms of making sure we can do what we want on those, in terms of ensuring that uh, on anybody who wants to communicate uh, across a 5G network has to do something that gives us royalties, right? So they're seeing that there's value here, multifaceted, and they're trying to leverage that. Um, the interesting thing is they need chips produced in the United States in order to make the Huawei routers work. Uh, because as I alluded to a minute ago, they haven't moved up the value chain in terms of things like microprocessor manufacturer. So that's one of the reasons they're really pushing this hard. And, and when they got uh, the um, developing their own chip industry and why they got really upset when the U.S. started uh, restricting chip exports is because it's undermining this strategy to seed the 5G infrastructure with Huawei equipment. So Scott, we've talked, I think we need to have another conversation sometime soon. There's so many other things I want to ask you. I'd love to have you back. Um, just in wrapping up, I, circling back to the way we started with the party Congress and thinking about what the next five years are going to look like. Um, what are, what are you concerned about? What do you think is important for people to really appreciate about China that isn't understood widely? Um, just want to hand it back to you for some closing remarks on that. Well, I think at the end of the day, it's we, despite the fact that this is known, it's not appreciated that it's the party in charge and the party is acting for the sake of the party. Xi Jinping is the head of the party and he's acting for the sake of the party and for the head of Xi Jinping. 
And so the actions that he takes are taken with that in mind. Um, and, you know, you mentioned the, the national security strategy, uh, the United States national security strategy that was uh, just recently released. And it talks in there about the need to um, cooperate for certain uh, goals, right? Some things we're going to compete with the PRC, but we have to understand there's things we can cooperate on. But if you read through some of the stuff they list, like, well, why do you think the PRC shares your objectives here? Right, whether it be um, you know climate regulation or labor regulation or or economic system, we tend to project or proliferation is another one, right? Nuclear proliferation. We tend to project onto the PRC what we see as common problems. We project that they see them as common problems and see them in the same terms, but they do not. The party sees them in terms of the party's position and its role in leadership. And so, you know, nuclear proliferation to many in the US government is bad because it is bad, right? To, to the PRC, it is, well, if North Korea has it, are they causing trouble for the United States or for us? If Iran has nuclear weapons, is it causing trouble for us or for the United States? Because it's not necessarily bad if it helps me maintain my power here in the PRC and maintain my role of influence in my region and the world. And so we need to make sure we look at PRC foreign policy, much less their domestic policy, through the lens of how it serves the party and forget about what we think the world should be when we're trying to understand what they do. I'm not saying forget about what we think the world should be. We should absolutely pursue our objectives, but we need to understand that this party who is competing with us does not see the world on the same terms. It's through the lens of the party, through that hierarchy and the, the moral and political system that support it. So, so if I, what I'm hearing is that we need to take more seriously that it's, it is a dictatorship. It has very different assumptions about what its goals are versus the kind of society that we live in with, with all of its problems. It's certainly not the same orientation of keeping the party in power. Um, Scott, it's been fascinating. I, I really enjoyed talking to you today. I learned a lot and I, it, it's always fun to, to hear from your experience and your knowledge on this. I'd love to have you back to talk more about China at some point and uh, we'll draw a line here. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It was, it was a lot of fun. Happy to come back.